Good morning. Um, as I start, let me just say that um, if, if this is new to you, Medicaid and CHIP are new to you, this is what I tell all staffers who are getting into Medicaid for the first time. Medicaid isn't rocket science. It's harder. <laughs> so you might have to go through this numerous times. I have been in your spot and thinking this is way too much. I just need to move back to Missouri. But let me tell you, it will be okay. You will figure this out. I'm waiting for the magic of my slides to pop up. Am I just going to go advance and it'll do it? Oh, okay. There we go. So what I want to do is give you a, a brief background on MACPAC, where I work. And then we'll talk big picture about Medicaid and CHIP. Then we'll get down into the details about how they work, uh, about the statutory authorities since uh, you're working for Congress and across the street is where they make those laws. Uh, and talk about the different federal state roles. Then we'll talk about who is covered in terms of eligibility, what is covered in terms of the benefits and the cost sharing, and then how much, how much is paid for the payment and financing. And then we'll briefly hit on some selected policy issues. We're going to be going through a lot. There are a lot of slides. I'm going to go through them pretty fast. I'm not going to read through every one. But as you have questions, write them down and so that when we get to the end, um, you can tee those up because some of those questions we may have addressed along the way, but if not, we definitely want to hit on those. MACPAC is a congressional commission. It's been around for five years now, and our statutory charges include reviewing and making recommendations to the Congress that affect Medicaid and CHIP. I'm not a commissioner. We have 17 commissioners. I'm a staffer for the commission and support them in their work. Uh, the Commission submits reports every March and every June. We are required to do that. We hold public meetings about, about every month or two. And outside of our regular March and June reports, we put out a, a variety of products, examples you see here. So we have 17 commissioners. They come from various backgrounds and from across the country. They are appointed by the Controller General, so from the Government Accountability Office and they serve three-year terms. So we've just gotten a new class of commissioners. They're great commissioners, so kudos to uh, GAO in selecting them. So now let's get down into uh, some of the detail on, on Medicaid and CHIP. Generally, I'm going to talk about Medicaid because it's the bigger, much bigger program, as we'll see. And then I'll tell you how CHIP differs or some different factoids about CHIP. And we can talk more as much as you want about CHIP when we get into the Q&A, but I hope that this way we'll kind of set up how they differ. But the thing to keep in mind about Medicaid is it covers people who may not be eligible for health insurance. Even among low-income people who are working full-time, they are much less likely to work for employers that offer health insurance. So they may not have access, even when they're working full-time, to health insurance and Medicaid is there for them. Um, and they may not be able to afford it when it is offered, so that is one of the roles that Medicaid plays. In addition, Medicaid covers benefits that other insurance does not typically cover. Long-term care, for example. Now, Medicare covers nursing home um, for some period of time after a hospitalization, for example, but Medicaid covers it for, um, you know, as long as a person lives. So when you have a family member who is on a public program who's in a nursing home, chances are that person is on, is on Medicaid. It also covers transportation. Your employer-sponsored coverage is not going to pay somebody to take you to your doctor's appointment. That is something unique to, to Medicaid. And it serves as a major source of financing for um, certain providers. We think of that in, usually in terms of hospitals that serve disproportionately low-income individuals. Now, in terms of the people, Medicaid and CHIP cover about a quarter of the U.S. population and a half, about half of all children. So we're talking about 72 million in Medicaid and 8 million kids in CHIP. So there's the first time you really see how much bigger Medicaid is compared to CHIP. Medicaid covers about half of births nationally, 
And there are 16 million individuals who are aged, that is to say they're 65 and older, or who are eligible for Medicaid due to a disability, and they are what we call duly eligible. They're enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid. And we think of Medicaid as the payer of last resort. So Medicare pays all the bills first, and then Medicaid comes and wraps around. And that could be in terms of cost sharing, so for deductibles that might apply under Medicare, but it also could be benefits that Medicare doesn't cover, like the long-term use of nursing facilities. In terms of spending, Medicaid spends about half a trillion dollars a year. 300 billion of that is federal, 200 billion state. So it makes up 7.7% .7 of federal outlays. And this next bullet takes, I wanna take some time to walk through this because you'll often hear states say, oh my gosh, a quarter of our budget goes to Medicaid. But that includes the dollars that the state is getting from the federal government and then paying out. So one could contend that a more accurate number, if you're trying to look at what the state itself is actually paying for Medicaid, it is that 14.8% on average looking at the state-funded part of the state budget. And other factoids that you see here for Medicaid. And here again, you see that CHIP is much smaller than Medicaid with $13 billion in spending, 70% of that being federal. So CHIP, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but CHIP pays a higher matching rate for, from the federal government. We look at projections and CBO projects that enrollment in Medicaid is going to grow to more than 90 million by 2018. That Medicaid's share of national health expenditures is going to grow to nearly 18% over the next decade and that states are projecting Medicaid spending of $600 billion over the next couple of years. So now we're gonna start getting down more into the weeds about how these programs work. Medicaid is an entitlement for eligible individuals. That means if you meet the criteria, the state must enroll you. In addition, the federal government is obligated to pay money to the state in those matching funds. It's open-ended. CHIP is different in that it is not a, an entitlement to individuals, so states have the flexibility to cap enrollment, to say you have to be uninsured for 90 days before we enroll you. Um, so that's where separate CHIP programs can be different. In addition, the federal funding is capped and it's only appropriated right now through fiscal year 2015. So the CHIP program under current law is gonna start running out of money. We'll talk more about that in a minute. You have to think about statute regulations and then guidance. The statute is the law, what your bosses are working on across the street, that trumps everything. For Medicaid, it's in Title 19 of the Social Security Act. CHIP is Title 21. Then to implement that, those laws, there are regulations that the federal government puts out and you see where you can access those. They're available online. And then below regulations, sub-regulatory guidance, which comes in the forms of letters to state Medicaid directors. And then when they want to send letters to the CHIP directors too, those are called letters to state health officials and other information. <laughs> the state plan is a Medicaid state plan is a contract between the federal government and the state. And it's several hundred pages filled with templated pages that the state has filled out and the federal government has approved. That is the contract that binds the federal and state governments to each other in their Medicaid and their CHIP programs. However, states can do things that are outside of that template they want to do something different that doesn't quite fit, and those are what we call waivers. There are Section 1115 waivers. Um, some of the states that have done um, the expansion to the new adult group in Medicaid have used waivers to do new things or different things, different approaches. 
And then there are other waivers that actually exist within the Medicaid statute, and that's why they're Section 19, because it's in Title 19. So Section 1915B, your managed care waivers. Um, and there are, Congress has created multiple ways for states to implement managed care. This waiver is one approach. There are many approaches. So as you get into the weeds, it, it becomes really hard to untangle what's going on. But um, this is just to show that there, there is flexibility that Congress has provided to the states in terms of, of waivers. Um, 1915C is another example of a waiver for home and community-based services. So individuals who would be eligible for long-term services uh, and supports, maybe in a nursing home, the state can say, wait, we think you can get better treatment and maybe even save us money if we can treat you, have you receive services in the home. So that's what those are about, HCBS. So as part of this contract, states actually run the Medicaid and CHIP programs on a day-to-day -day basis. That is what distinguishes it from Medicare, which is a large, you know, a federal program. Medicaid and CHIP are really run by the states. That means the, the favorite saying we like to have is it varies by state when you're looking at, at Medicaid and CHIP programs. It is overseen at the federal level by CMS, and CMS approves or disapproves state plans, state plan amendments, which are called SPAs, and those are, if the state wants to change something in that contract, they fill out a SPA, they get that page in the state plan, they send it in, and CMS says, yeah, this looks good or not. So that's what the SPAs are, but also waiver applications and renewals and claims for federal reimbursement to get the money. So now let's talk about how Medicaid and CHIP work in terms of eligibility. Medicaid is a means-tested program, so you have to meet financial criteria. But in addition, there are other criteria, such as having a satisfactory immigration status or documentation of your citizenship. It had been the case when Medicaid was first started that you didn't just go to apply for Medicaid. In fact, you applied for some other means-tested program like welfare, and that automatically got you Medicaid eligibility and enrollment. Over the years, Congress has said, we want to delink that, and we want to allow people to be eligible just based on their income, regardless if they're eligible for, for some other program. When Medicaid was first enacted, there were only five groups that could be in eligible, aged, blind, disabled, kids, and the parents of those kids. But over time, Congress has added new groups. They added pregnant women. They added people who were infected with TB until, in the ACA, kind of added the last final group. So now anybody who uh, meets the income and the citizenship, uh, satisfactory immigration status, anybody could be eligible. So that's what the last bullet is. Adults without dependent children were added as an eligible population by the ACA. Again, only citizens or qualified non-citizens can receive full Medicaid benefits. There are groups, however, who can receive limited benefits. Hospitals can receive payments for non-qualified aliens who meet all the other eligibility criteria that exist in Medicaid except for their immigration status. So that ensures that as hospitals treat these individuals, they will get some payment for them. Um, also, assistance with Medicare costs, as we kind of alluded to with the help with cost sharing for those who are subject to deductibles and, and co-payments in, in Medicare. Mm -hmm and family planning and related services. So states can say, look, we're only going to higher up the income scale. We're going to allow individuals to access family planning services. In addition, those who want or are seeking long-term services and supports may have to meet additional requirements. So demonstrating that they have limitations in their uh, ability to feed themselves, bathe, et cetera. So this kind of gets at the point that, that Judy mentioned. When you look at enrollment, almost half of Medicaid enrollees are kids. 
and less than a, about a quarter are aged and disabled. So you look at that part of the figure and you say, wow, kids are the most important group when you're looking at Medicaid. But when you look at spending, it's a totally different story because on a per capita basis, kids aren't very expensive. But the disabled now make up almost half of the spending. So the folks who focus on the money side say, oh, the disabled, those are the people we really need to focus on. So let's talk about the aged and disabled. Aged, again, those age 65 and older, and the disabled are those who are under age 65 who have a disability determination. Now, for the aged and disabled, their eligibility kind of looks like the original Medicaid in terms of in most states, it is enrollment in another program that gets them eligibility for Medicaid. And it is eligibility for SSI. So that is providing additional uh, income to individuals who are aged and disabled, who are below, as you see here, 74% um, of the federal poverty level and have limited assets. FPL stands for federal poverty level. So I'm gonna hit this acronym over and over again. For a family of three, 100% of poverty is about $20,000 a year. So keep that in mind as I throw out these percentages. Again, 100% of poverty for a family of three is about $20,000 a year. Now, states may choose to expand eligibility to higher up the income scale, so up to 100% of poverty for the aged and disabled, and they have other, other pathways as well, generally targeted for individuals who have uh, high health care spending, uh, especially in nursing homes. Individuals who are duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare make up the bulk of Medicaid enrollees over age 65. In other words, most folks who are over age 65 get Medicare. So those who are over age 65 and get both Medicare and Medicaid, chances are they're, um, those who are over age 65 are getting both. And you can see some other factoids there about those who are duly eligible. Now, talking about the non-disabled adults and the children. So non-disabled adults, we're talking about age 19 to 64. Parents are eligible, and it's under Section 1931 is that pathway, and that's going to matter. You think, why, why does that matter, 1931? But I'll show you in a bit, because parents are required up to a certain FPL level. States are required to enroll them before the ACA ever came along. And on average, that level varies by state, but it's at about 40% of poverty, I want to say. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, pregnant women and the new adult group, which covers up to 133% of poverty, the ACA said you have to cover these individuals up to 133% of poverty. And of course, the Supreme Court came and said, no, you have the choice. It's voluntary as to whether you do that. And I think we're up to 27, 28 states, including the district, that do that now. For children, Medicaid must cover up to 138% of the federal poverty level. And the ACA had a, a provision that said, okay, states, you can go higher up the income scale. And generally, states can roll that back. They can extend farther, et cetera. But what the ACA said was it required a maintenance of effort, saying if you're at 200% of poverty, you cannot roll that back for kids, at least until 2019, for Medicaid and CHIP. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So some of the selected ACA Medicaid changes, a big one was modified adjusted gross income, or MAGI, so it's not the, th the three wise men. But that is the acronym. That's how people pronounce it. What happened was prior to the ACA, when you came in to apply for Medicaid as a child, as a parent, as a pregnant woman, states had all kinds of different ways that they counted income. Whether child support was counted, whether this was counted, whether that was counted. And then states varied all over the place because they would have disregards. So some states would say, you know, if you're a parent and you're working, we're going to disregard half of your earnings. 
So that has a big impact. So states could, you know, two states could say we're both at 50% of poverty, but in reality, those eligibility levels differed substantially. So the ACA said, let's do away with that, not for the aged and disabled, but for the parents, for the kids, for this new adult group. We're going to come up with a national standard. So whatever your eligibility level was, we're going to convert it to some new FPL that reflects this new way we're counting income. Um, the new adult group that is required of states, except it's not required, uh, up to 138% of poverty. And there were some other, other issues um, that were in the ACA as well. Okay, so how does CHIP differ from Medicaid in terms of eligibility? CHIP came along in 1997. States in their Medicaid programs already had flexibility to extend really as high up the income scale as they wanted. So there was some variation, up to 133% of poverty in some states, up to 200% of poverty, up to higher. CHIP came along and said, look, there are a lot of uninsured kids who are just above the Medicaid eligibility level. They're in working families. They're, they can't afford those premiums if they're offered employer-sponsored coverage. Um, so we need to do something. That was the genesis of the CHIP program. There are no federal minimum levels in CHIP, so it does vary by state. 175% of poverty in North Dakota, up to 405% of poverty in New York. Then when Congress said, okay, you can create this CHIP program. We're going to give you two options to do it. Number one, and probably the easiest option, is let's say you're, you're already covering up to 150% of poverty in Medicaid. You can just take your Medicaid program and extend farther up the income scale, so to 200% of poverty. The difference is you're going to get CHIP funding for those kids, and that matching rate from the federal government is higher. So that was option number one. Option number two is Congress said, well, at the same time, we want to give states more flexibility. Maybe they don't want to have the exact same benefits that are required under Medicaid. Maybe states want to charge some cost sharing, some premiums. And so we want to give states the flexibility to do that so they can create a CHIP program separate from Medicaid. And in that case, um, those children are also funded by CHIP but it's a separate program, it looks different. And states can actually have both types of programs, and in fact, most states do. So under CHIP, they have both a Medicaid expansion CHIP program and a separate CHIP program. So let me show you what this looks like. West Virginia as an example. Now, first of all, let's think about what has changed because of 2014. What has changed, first of all, is what's in the yellow. There is now this subsidized exchange coverage, whatever you want to call it, marketplace coverage, uh, exchange coverage, Obamacare coverage, that's healthcare.gov. So that now exists. And even though that's all filled in with yellow, just note that not everybody who's in that income range is necessarily eligible for exchange subsidies. So if you're offered employer-sponsored coverage that's considered by the ACA to be affordable, you don't get the, the subsidies. And I think you'll hear about that this afternoon. Um, but now let's talk about the green. So those are um, just regular Medicaid paid for by Medicaid. And what West Virginia has done is they have gone, they've expanded their Medicaid program for kids up to certain levels. And to the extent that that level exceeds what it was in 1997, they get chip match for that. So that's why those kids in the blue are considered Medicaid expansion CHIP kids. Again, they're Medicaid kids. They don't know they're in CHIP, but the state's getting more money for them. Then higher up the income scale, the state has said, we want to do other things, um, and that's, those are the separate CHIP kids. And I want to show you a state that has not implemented the Medicaid expansion for adults. So here, you see in the bottom right uh, the, the gap where there is no coverage. So the, the little green for the parents, that's that 1931 coverage I was talking about. 
So the state is required to do that. That's a long-standing requirement for parents. Um, and note that the subsidized exchange coverage below 100% of poverty for citizens, there are no exchange subsidies. And so what would happen if this state said, we're going to implement the expansion to the new adult group? Well, they would get 100% match for those who are newly eligible. So those parents under 1931, they're not newly eligible. They wouldn't get that, that super match, um, but the newly eligible would. Okay, so now let's talk about the kids. As you can see, what is going on with states' expansions to the new adult group really has no bearing on what's going on with kids and SHIP. Those are, those are separate issues altogether. So when we're talking about Medicaid expansion CHIP, don't confuse that with what's going on with adults and state decisions around that. Okay, benefits and cost sharing in, in Medicaid and CHIP. And when I say benefits, I don't mean, oh, benefits is in, this is a good program for these reasons. I'm talking specifically about the benefits, the services that are covered by the program. So this is the list of mandatory Medicaid services. Every program that has a Medicaid program must cover inpatient hospital, outpatient hospital, physician services. And this fourth one I want to focus on, EPSDT. If you've never heard that before, say it several times and get used to having that just roll off your tongue because this is critically important to advocates of children's health. What it essentially says is besides these mandatory benefits, let's go to the next slide and look at optional benefits. There are many benefits that are optional to states that they can choose not to cover. When you're looking at adults, eyeglasses, Dental services don't have to be covered. In many states, they're not. A whole list here. But what EPSDT says is state, for children who are under age 21, if they go get screened, and in that screening, the doc says, or whoever the provider is, says, this child needs this service. Even if you as a state have not opted to take, to, to cover that service for adults, you must provide that service to children. So EPSDT is a big deal um, in terms of the, the mandatory benefits for, for kids. In addition, there are some what I like to call uh, statutory principles around Medicaid benefits. One is amount, duration, and scope. If you're going to get into Medicaid, get used to saying that real fast too, amount, duration, and scope. And what that is, is the statute doesn't say exactly how many days of hospitalization you have to offer. All it says is it has to be reasonable in amount, duration, and scope to achieve its purpose. So states have in the past said, okay, we have to cover inpatient hospital, and we're going to cover 10 days a year. Beneficiaries sued over that. And the court said, you have flexibility, state, that's true, but 10 days a year is not reasonable in amount, duration, and scope. Therefore, you must offer, and I forget what the number was, I, I want to say it was 20 days, but um, this is where state flexibility and federal parameters come in because versus Medicare, which has a lot of formulaic, very specific rules, Medicaid often just has kind of principles like this. Uh, other principles are comparability, that you get the same benefits for all enrollees in the program, statewideness across the state, everybody gets the same thing, freedom of choice, if a doctor or other health care provider is participating in Medicaid, you can choose that, that provider. Now, waivers exist to waive all these things. That is the purpose, one of the primary purposes of waivers. So you think about that in terms of HCBS, right, those home and community-based services we were talking about. The state doesn't want to give everybody in the state services in their home. They want to be able to cap those services to limit the number of people who get those. And so to do that, they have to, they have to get a waiver of comparability. We're not going to give this service to everybody who's enrolled in Medicaid. Um, now let's look at cost sharing. Individuals who are in Medicaid can be charged cost sharing. 
but there are first exemptions of a bunch of people are exempted, populations, children, pregnant women, you see the list there. In addition, there are services for which individuals cannot be charged cost sharing, emergency services, you see the list there. Okay, so if you're not in one of those groups and we're not talking about one of those services, what is the cost sharing that can apply? The overall rule is first of all, the cost sharing cannot exceed 5% of your income. But then below that, there are more strictures. First is, if you're below 150% of poverty, basically you can't be charged more than what is called nominal cost sharing. And you can see the amounts there. But above 150% of poverty, there's more flexibility, but always subject to that 5% of income cap. So let's talk again about how CHIP differs from Medicaid, this time with respect to benefits and cost sharing. If we're talking about Medicaid expansion CHIP programs, there's no difference, right? These are kids who are enrolled in Medicaid. They're just being paid for by CHIP. So those kids get EPSDT with little or, little or no cost sharing, unless the state obtains a waiver. The separate CHIP programs, again, those were intentionally designed to be different, so to potentially resemble commercial coverage more in terms of what they cover, um, with the exception of dental. Dental must be covered in your separate CHIP program. And it's interesting that even though states have the flexibility to ratchet back their benefits, actually a third of separate CHIP programs still benchmark to the Medicaid benefit package anyway. In other words, the flexibility that they're using is not so much on the benefits side, but it's probably on the premiums and cost sharing side. And again, premiums and cost sharing, even in separate CHIP programs, are limited to no more than 5% of income. All right, so there uh, we've hit on eligibility and benefits and cost sharing. Now let's talk about the money. The federal money that states get is based on the FMAP. That's the matching rate from the federal government. And we'll talk about um, that more in a bit. Versus administrative expenses, which are generally 50% across the board for all states. And then states submit the bill, as it were, to the federal government, to CMS, and they say, here's my $100 bill. If my FMAP is 60%, you give me $60. The FMAP is based on a formula that gives a higher matching rate to states with a lower per capita income. And it varies from 50%, which is the statutory floor, up to 74%. Again, this is what the federal government pays for Medicaid services. Um, and there are some, some variations. The CHIP matching rate, again, is higher, so it requires states to pay 30% less for services, so that's why it ranges from 65 to 82%. So this slide just shows you pictorially how the FMAPs vary. We've got about a dozen states who are at that minimum FMAP of 50%, and it goes up, up as high as 74% in Mississippi. And then there's a new FMAP that's for that newly eligible group, as I mentioned. And here you see here, I'm just going to go over the first row. That population is eligible for 100% match. This was a new population as of 2014, 100% in 2015 and 16, and then it starts to scale down to 90% for 2020 and beyond. Uh, so you think about, we've been talking about what the federal government pays for Medicaid expenses, but the state has their share that they also have to raise. Where do they get their money from? And this slide shows you where they get their money from. By and large, it's from state general revenue. So it's from the money they get from income taxes, property taxes, et cetera. In addition, though, local governments can contribute, and they often do. So counties contribute, and um, municipalities contribute, and that all varies by state, of course. So you see that 16% overall of the non-federal share comes from uh, local government contributions. Um, these acronyms are kind of scary acronyms, so I'll just go over them because they're really not that scary. Uh, IGTs, 
intergovernmental transfers, that's basically just when the county, for example, transfers money to the state, says use this for Medicaid. And CPEs are where, let's say you've got a county hospital and they're providing Medicaid services. They send over to the state, look, these are certified public expenditures. We, as a county hospital, spent this money on Medicaid enrollees and we want federal match. You know, we need to draw down the federal match for that. Then there are health care related taxes. These are taxes that are um, put on hospitals, on uh, facility, other facilities. So I want to tee this up because I know it's really easy when you start hearing about this stuff to just fall asleep. But I'm telling you, this is a big deal because you may be from a state that says, we hate taxes, we don't do taxes. And then when it's time to think about doing a hospital tax, the hospitals all say, yeah, we're in. And here's why. So we're going to walk through this example. Step one is the hospitals are assessed a tax. So they pay $40 for this tax. And the state says, thank you very much. We're going to take this $40 and we're going to put $24 of it in a provider tax account and $16 in a general fund. Now, with this money as our, the state share, we're now going to make payments to the hospital. The payment from Medicaid that we're going to make is $60. That may be a $60 payment for services that people receive, or that may be a supplemental payment. Essentially, the state just cuts a check and says, here's $60. Same with the other health care providers. $40 is sent to other health care providers in this, in this example. Okay, so now the state says, I've spent, as you see at the top, 60 and 40, I've spent $100 give me the federal share. So if the FMAP is 60%, then the state, the CMS sends over 36 plus 24, which is $60, right? Okay, so now let's think about how this nets out. The hospitals paid 40 and got 60, so they netted out 20. The federal government paid 60. The other health care providers, they got 40. And the state on net paid nothing. So that is one of the reasons why hospitals are supportive often of these taxes. There are limits on these and it gets really complicated really fast because the, the federal government has tried to make sure this doesn't get way out of control, uh, which is a topic for a whole other session. Uh, but I will hit on it a little bit in a minute. Uh, but let's talk about uh, payments to providers. When we're talking about payments to providers for services, we generally bucket them as fee-for-service and managed care. And fee-for-service is just where the state has said, we pay X dollars for this service. And when the, the practitioner or the facility uh, provides that service, they send in the bill to the state and the state pays it, end of story. On the other hand, states can use managed care. And that's where the state says, we don't want to set all these rates. We don't want to have to deal with all this claims processing stuff. Here's what we'll do. We will pay a plan, a managed care organization, and they will be the ones who pay for the services uh, with each of these providers. And we'll just pay them a rate. Well, at this point, about half of Medicaid, enroll, Medicaid enrollees are in managed care plans that provide comprehensive services. However, I note that only 24% of Medicaid benefit spending is for comprehensive managed care. Why is that? Well, that goes back to that chart we were looking at earlier, where managed care really is targeted for the, the parents, and the kids who tend to be less expensive, although more numerous in, in Medicaid. So that's how this comes to be reflected here, although managed care is growing among the aged and disabled in Medicaid. So this is a trend to, to watch. And I should say managed care in the Medicaid context just means using a private plan to pay for, for the services. 
when you're looking at you know your own employer sponsored coverage managed care often means something different from you know other types of arrangements so just so you know in in the medicaid jargon managed care organizations just mean use of a private plan okay so i mentioned um that there are restrictions on healthcare related taxes and the payments that can be made for supplemental payments. Again, Medicaid is different because the federal government doesn't provide a lot of formulas about how payments are made. States decide that. But there are principles, and the big principle is 1902A30A. So whereas Medicare has pages and pages and pages about how to make payments, Medicaid primarily has this one sentence, and it says, Whatever you pay, state, it needs to safeguard against overutilization. The payments need to be consistent with efficiency, economy, and quality, and they have to be sufficient to enlist enough providers so that people get access to care comparable to everybody else in that area. So you can see where states and the federal government, there's a lot of wiggle room about how you implement this. And there, has not, there have not been regulations that are on the books about how the executive branch says, this is how you do this. So there have been lawsuits. There's one going to the Supreme Court right now where payments were cut and the provider said, wait a minute, this makes these payments not sufficient. And so the case that's going to the Supreme Court is basically asking, do providers really have a right to sue over this little sentence here, as important as it is? Um, and so to demonstrate the state variation that results, um, first noting for hospitals, Medicaid actually does a pretty good job of paying hospitals when you look at it as a percent of cost. And also when you look at what Medicaid pays hospitals as compared to Medicare, they're often on par. Maybe sometimes Medicaid's a little higher on average, sometimes a little lower. And a lot of that has to do with those supplemental payments, but it, it is... Uh, one of the important roles that Medicaid pays, as you'll hear from people who come into your offices, is in these low-income areas, these hospitals are struggling and they need those supplemental payments to make them whole, as it were. When we look at physician payments, there's huge variation, as you see. As you compare what Medicaid pays versus Medicare, it ranges from 37% in Rhode Island to more than what Medicare pays, 134% in North Dakota. And that's looking at just the fee-for-service rates. To the extent that a state says, forget it, we're out of this, you manage care plan, you pay the providers, a lot of times we believe that whatever the fee-for-service rate is is pretty comparable to what the managed care plan is paying, but it's really hard to know that information. So supplemental payments we've talked about, um, they're made in addition to standard payment for services. They're not necessarily associated with specific services. They're often provide, uh, financed with provider taxes and IGTs. There are essentially two types of supplemental payments, DISH payments and UPL payments, and I'm not going to go into details on that here. Um, but you can, you can see these slides and get some more background on that because I want to start to get to the, the chip issues. So how does CHIP differ? CHIP differs in that it is a capped allotment and the money states can use, theoretically, exhaust their funds in a given year. But right now, there are no new CHIP allotments after fiscal year 2015. That does not mean, however, that when fiscal year 2016 starts, the program ends. Um, and fiscal year 2016 starts October 1st, 2015, so October 1st this year. Because states have their allotments, their CHIP allotments, available to them for two years. And nearly every state is projected to have some CHIP allotments left over when they start 2016. So they're going to be, they're going to run out at different points during the year. They're going to be running on fumes, as it were. When are they going to run out? That's going to depend on how much they're rolling over. And there is an interesting provision of the ACA that said, in 2016, the federal chip matching rate is going to increase by 23 percentage points. 
So as the money runs out, now it's at a higher federal match. So it's essentially increasing the burn rate. It's accelerating the, the date at which states are going to run out of that money. So what happens when SHIP funds are exhausted? It, it, it depends, and this is why I made such a big deal of this distinction about Medicaid expansion SHIP versus separate SHIP. It really is going to depend on the extent to which your state uses Medicaid expansion SHIP versus separate SHIP. If you're a Medicaid expansion SHIP, for those kids, you go from the CHIP matching rate to the Medicaid matching rate. But you still get federal money, and as a result, that maintenance of effort still, still continues. You cannot, for your Medicaid expansion SHIP kids, change your eligibility, at least until 2019. So that means, for Medicaid expansion SHIP kids, the coverage continues, there's no increase in uninsurance, but the state is on the hook for more dollars. Then we look at separate CHIP kids, there the scenario is different. Once the CHIP money is gone, that's it. There is no more federal CHIP money. So that's nice federal government that you said we have to continue this through 2019. There's no federal money, we're out, we're done. We as a state have no further obligation. States can close down those separate CHIP programs. So if that happens, uh, we're going to see different results, and that's going to, again, vary by state. So that's why we've put in this slide that shows you what percentage of a state's CHIP spending is for those Medicaid expansion CHIP kids. Essentially, if we look on the right-hand side, more than 90% of their CHIP spending is for Medicaid expansions. That means in Alaska, in Arizona, you're, if CHIP money runs out, you're not going to see a huge jump in uninsured kids because that coverage has to continue. But the state is going to complain because they're being required to pay more for that coverage. On the other hand, if we look on the other side, in Kansas, Oregon, and Washington as examples, where less than 10% of their CHIP spending is for Medicaid expansion coverage. So separate CHIP programs. The money runs out, they can close down those programs, but what happens to those kids? And so as you see, most states are kind of in the middle where they've got some of their kids or Medicaid expansion chip kids, they're going to be on the hook, the state, for more dollars versus the separate chip kids. Where do they go? This next slide shows, based on projections that we have received from the Urban Institute, where do these kids go nationally? So among the 3.7 million separate chip kids who, if the money runs out, assume the state just closes down that program, where do these kids end up? All of these kids are eligible for something else. They are either eligible for employer-sponsored coverage or they are offered, they are eligible for subsidized exchange coverage. However, 1.1 million are projected to end up uninsured. Why? Because the cost of that coverage, the premiums, are substantially higher than what they pay now under CHIP. Um, nevertheless, 1.2 million are projected to enroll in employer-sponsored coverage if CHIP were, separate CHIP coverage were to end, and 1.4 million would enroll in subsidized exchange coverage. And to give you a little more flavor about those kids who become uninsured, one of the uh, estimates that we have is among those who become uninsured, 90% have a parent who works full-time. And this is indicative just of the CHIP population, right? These are kids who are above the regular Medicaid level, so it stands to reason that these are going to be working families by and large. So the policy issues to think about um, on the CHIP side, since we're talking about that, should CHIP be extended? Our commission has said that CHIP should be extended, and we have recommended an extension for two years in the hopes that maybe CHIP wouldn't be necessary in the future and we could figure out how to make coverage more affordable. Um, so we are continuing to analyze that and we, we will see how that goes. What would be the experience of children now enrolled in CHIP if the program ended? So you've gotten some indication that some children will become uninsured. Even those who enroll in coverage though, they are certainly going to be paying more out of pocket 
for premiums and or cost sharing. And then again, is there an ongoing long-term role for CHIP given the availability of new sources of coverage? In Medicaid, the, the potential issues are, are numerous, but just a, a few, what, what to be done about the level and growth of Medicaid spending and enrollment, how do we balance this state flexibility versus federal parameters and federal controls since the federal government's paying half or more than the dollars? Um, how do we encourage and monitor the diffusion of payment delivery systems, um, innovations, and then what are the impacts of state decisions regarding the eligibility expansion for the new adult group? So with that, I will conclude and turn it over to your questions. Mm -hmm.